David Simpson. So, yes, uh, hi. So, ah, no, I am really learning how to use this, I think, but learning on the job is never good. Okay, so that is your photo. I'm going to say nothing more about it, but you can explain through your story, David. Off you go. What do you mean he's putting us in the basement? Asked Chris indignantly. That's what he said. I shoved Chris down the stairs. Off to the right was a corridor with doors on both sides. I opened one and the fog of damp caught in my throat. At least it had a bed. We hadn't seen many of those on this trip. Our exciting plans to hitchhike to Spain had ground to a halt 30 miles south of Paris. Stuck all day with our thumbs out at a motorway service station. No one picked up three people, me, Chris and Anthony. It was getting late. We were hungry, but had very little money. Let's do the restaurant, said Chris provocatively. I followed along, not sure what doing the restaurant meant. Apparently, it meant walking around, spotting leftover food and grabbing it before the waiters cleared the table. Let the foraging begin, said Chris with his big, broad smile. Everything about Chris was broad. His shoulders, his sex life, his morality. Pick the meats, forget the veg. I stood nervously to one side, embarrassed. Chris swooped like a hungry, hungry gull, snatching the juiciest bits into his napkin. I managed a few rolls. We hastily erected our tent on some waste ground at the back of the services. We ate and drank and laughed about being homeless. Anthony could be a bit uptight, clipped in his speech, and you imagined him judging you as he looked at you, but having been too well brought up to actually say anything. He rummaged in his rucksack, bringing out his leather toilet bag. Bathroom calls. Chris and I looked at each other, shrugged, grabbed our plastic bags and ran to catch up with him. On entering the services bathroom, we found a man at, the ta at a table with a bowl of francs and centimes. Anthony strolled past, sure in his right to occupy the bathroom. Shit, I said, turning to Chris. Have you got any change? I smiled sheepishly while Chris, pu Chris pulled out a few coins. The, the old man nodded at our offering. Anthony was in full flight, gargling, flossing, and generally eradicating any known germs from his mouth. Chris and I hastily ran our brushes over our teeth. We stood in a line at the urinal. Bon nuit, we chorused as we left. We squeezed the three of us into a two-person tent. In the morning, we returned to the bathroom. The old man did a double take. You could see him thinking, weren't you all in here last night? Breakfast was another guerrilla raid on leftover food. Finally, a couple in a camper van picked us up. Where are you going? Chris asked breezily. Italy. We looked at each other, smiled with relief and clambered in. That was the end of going to Spain. You took what you could get when you were hitchhiking. Hours later, we slept under a clear starlit sky in the warm crystalline summer air high up in the Alps. Balm. Once we were over the border into Italy, we headed for Venice. Chris knew the sister of Luigi Nonno, a famous composer. Finding her villa in a quiet, well-to-do district, we knocked on the front door. You must be Christopher and his friends. A woman, stylishly dressed, beautifully coiffured, showed us in. The house was full of modern sculpture and paintings. You could almost see Anthony puffing up, feeling in his element. We each had a bed for the first time on this trip and slept well. 
we left the next morning to explore Venice. Later that day, we got talking to a young man in a bar. He'd heard our English and came over to practice his. Chatting away, he discovered we didn't have anywhere to stay. Come back to my home. We left the tourist parts of Venice and entered the narrow looming alleys where Venetians lived. Sure enough, his parents greeted us warmly and fed us royally. Our new friend told us his family had lived there for generations, but work was now scarce. As more of Venice geared itself towards tourists, the older trades and merchants were slowly going out of business. I have to work on the mainland. I'll probably move there. I don't have a choice, really. Cushions and pillows appeared from cupboards and under his bed. We slept in our sleeping bags on the living room floor. Standing at the train station the next morning, saying goodbye, I felt humbled. We'd landed in his city, paraded round it like a museum, whilst his people were slowly dying out. Rome, platform four, shouted Chris as we charged across the crowded concourse. Running with a rucksack is never easy. It seems to have a delayed bounce that always lands in the small of your back, just as you're trying to move forward. You have another contact in Rome, asked Anthony, slightly icily. Yeah, my mate Mike, he said we could stay. Outside Rome, we found the Appian Way. It's number four. The villa was behind high walls and ornate glass. Wow, I said, who are his parents? Oh, something at the embassy. I, I think he's the deputy ambassador. I'd never met a diplomat before. I hoped I had enough topics of conversation. What will you think of us, disheveled, tired hitchhikers? I shouldn't have worried. The father breezed in just as we were being served our meal. Mikey mentioned his friends might be calling in. Introductions were made. He understood we had all just finished our undergraduate degrees. I suppose you're all Marxists then, as you went to one of the newer universities. He couldn't have sounded more condescending if he was discussing inferior cuts of meat with his butcher. Anthony seemed to hold his knife and fork with a little more refinement as if signaling he wasn't with us. Chris, on the other hand, had no qualms. Yeah, Marxist, Leninist, if I had to choose great thinkers, change the world, he threw out as a challenge. Yes, smiled the deputy ambassador. Not right for Britannia, though. Quite soon, he got up and left. Staff cleared the table. I wondered how grand the bedrooms would be. I was really looking forward to a bit of well-earned luxury. Come this way, said the deputy ambassador and led us out into the corridor. Instead of turning right to the staircase, he turned left and opened a door. Find yourselves a room. He dismissively waved down the basement stairs. I don't think any of us slept much Chris was hopping mad when, he went, when we met up for breakfast. We ate hurriedly. There was no one to say goodbye to. Chris slammed the door behind us. We were glad to be out. I need a cigarette, said Anthony, fumbling with his packet. Ugh, I don't have a light, do you? I didn't smoke. My dad had emphysema. I've got one, said Chris as he foraged in an inside pocket. Anthony gasped. I was amazed. Sitting in Chris's hand was a large onyx ornamental cigarette lighter. Chris, shouted Anthony in outrage. What have you done? Putting us in the old servants quarters when there were four perfectly good bedrooms upstairs. Arrogant pig, he won't even miss it. 
I was shocked, but also a little envious to have that kind of panache. That's why I like being around Chris. Anthony threw his unlit cigarette on the ground, turned and walked off towards the bus stop. Chris smirked at me. I finally let out my breath and laughed, having first checked no one had come out of the house to chase us for stolen goods. We ended up at Spalonga, the beach where the ordinary Romans holidayed. We camped out at the deserted end. Chris built a lean-to with driftwood and grasses to the side of the tent to sleep in. Anthony hardly spoke two words to him. I ended up negotiating between them for whatever money we had to buy pizzas and a few tomatoes from the market. It was great though, sleeping on the beach. Sunsets, sunrises, clear crystal water, magic. Chris moved to Paris and developed a drug, drug habit. Anthony got a job in theater. I moved to Brixton for a second adolescence. Chris and I met up once or twice, but we never saw Anthony again. David, thank you so much. And there it is, a large <laughs> onyx thing. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Uh, David, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, a couple of things after. Surely the address couldn't really have been number four, the Appian Way. <laughs> I know it was the Appian Way. I may be slightly, a little bit of literary license, <laughs> but it was actually number four. This was 1970 something or other. So well, a long time ago. Fantastic. I, I don't, I, it reminded me of me when I went to Monaco. I have told this story before, and I always tell it when we do work in prisons. And I went to Monaco, and I was so enraged by the awfulness of the place and the tax dodging that was involved that when I went to the royal palace uh, from the gift into the gift shop, I stole the fridge magnet. That was, <laughs> that was me making my stand against right. the oppressors and the tax avoiders of Monaco. So yeah. I, I feel your I feel your friend's exasperation, and I. <laughs> I am such a centrist. I mean, there is nothing Marxist in it, not a right. Marxist bone in my body. But even I was, um, so yeah, I appreciate his um, 